The goal of this video is to briefly explain the high-level idea of pipelining. To do that, we're going to start with a motivating question. Imagine you're doing laundry and you have a washer which takes 30 minutes to wash one load of laundry. You have a dryer which takes 40 minutes and you can fold the laundry in about 20 minutes. It'll take 90 minutes to wash, dry, and fold one load of laundry. How long will it take to do four loads? Well, if we do it naively and do each load to completion before starting the next load, it's going to take 90 minutes times 4, or 6 hours. But that's not the way people do laundry. Typically, what's done is after the first load of laundry is done in the washer, we'll move it to the dryer and start the second load in the washer. Then, when the first load's done being dried, we can start folding it after we've moved the second load into the dryer and put the third load into the washer. This process is called pipelining, and when we pipeline laundry in this way, we can complete those same four loads which sequentially took six hours in only three and a half hours. We can draw a number of important lessons about pipelining from this simple example. First, that the key idea of pipelining is that we're breaking one task, that is doing a load of laundry, into a collection of subtasks, washing the load, drying the load, and folding it, and assigning each of these to their own resources, the washer, the dryer, and the person. You'll note that pipelining doesn't improve the latency of doing any load of laundry, that each load of laundry is still taking at least 90 minutes. The key benefit of pipelining is that it helps throughput, that we're able to do a number of loads of laundry in less time than it would take if we had done them sequentially. When we pipeline, our performance benefit is going to be limited by the slowest pipeline stage. In this case, the wash, the dryer. The dryer takes 40 minutes, whereas the washer only takes 30, and the folding only takes 20 minutes. And so, if we had an infinite number of loads of laundry, we would still only complete one every 40 minutes because the wa this dryer is our rate limiting step. Our potential speed up in an ideal case is equal to the number of pipeline stages. That because we have three pipeline stages, we could, in an ideal case, run three times as fast. But there's two reasons that we typically don't reach this ideal. First is, if the pipeline stages are unbalanced, as they are in this example that because the washer takes more time than because the dryer takes more time than the washer or folding these resources the washer and the person folding are left idle much of the time and that's going to eat into our speed up furthermore if we don't have very many items to work on there's a, a, a time to fill the pipeline this first 70 minutes in which we're not using all of the resources that only after 70, unit, 70 minutes are we using all of our resources. And then at the end, there's a time to drain the pipeline, where again, we aren't using all of our resources. And this, this also is going to reduce our speed up. So let's briefly look at how we're going to apply this idea of pipelining to processors. What I've shown here is the data path for the single cycle um, MIPS processor that we discussed in lecture. And I'm ignoring the, the branch uh, circuit for the moment. So let's look at how a load instruction moves through this machine. That the first step the load does is instruction fetch. That we take the program counter value and read the instruction out. Once we've done that, we can do the instruction decode step which takes those inst that instruction and uses it to read the source register out of the register file. Using that source register value, as well as the immediate encoded in the instruction, we can compute the effective address in the execute step. Once we've done this, we can access the memory in the memory stage and read the value out of the memory. In the final stage, called writeback, we can take that memory value and move it 
into the register file through the register write port. If you look at what's happening over time, that during our clock period, each execution step is using a different part of our machine. That only at the very beginning of the cycle are we accessing the instruction memory. And then it's sitting idle for most of the cycle until the beginning of the next cycle when we again read the instruction out of the instruction memory. Similarly, the, the register file read ports we're only using for a short period after we've received the instruction and then we don't use it for the rest of the cycle. So this is true for all of our hardware and so we end up having a lot of hardware that's sitting around not doing anything for much of our clock period. So what we'd like to do is put that hardware to work that when an instruction is done reading the instruction memory that we've received the instruction out of the instruction memory and we're starting to access the register file this instruction memory is now being idle what we'd like to do is begin fetching a second instruction at that point. And similarly, when this first instruction is done reading the register file and is moved on to the execution stage, and the second instruction, we've read the instruction and would like to read the register file, we're going to go ahead and start fetching a third instruction, and so on and so forth. So what we propose doing is actually breaking our machine into five pieces, these five stages I just described, and pipelining our machine into these five stages. So we'll have an instruction fetch stage, an instruction decode stage, an execute stage, a memory stage, and a write back stage. And we'll be able to support five instructions executing in the machine in parallel, one in each of these stages. And you'll note, again, as a key property of pipelining, is that each stage has its own resources. The instruction memory is part of the instruction fetch stage, so on and so forth.